I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. And you know, it's all about the neighborhood. This is a conversation about how we build our community, our neighborhood, house by house, family by family. We're focusing on business creation, business development, economic development, and culture. McFarland, welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. Today's program focuses on predatory lending. Uh, what are the challenges facing communities of color in general, the black community in particular? Uh, what are the credit concerns that we have? How do we create legislation that protects us? How do we create policy that guides uh, uh, activity that is appropriate, productive for our community, and that dissuades unscrupulousness that hurts our community. And uh, how do we educate, inform uh, ordinary people so that they understand their rights, they understand uh, the best strategies for being effective citizens in our community around credit, around borrowing, around building wealth. I'm pleased to have Commissioner Kevin Lindsay. He's Minnesota's Commissioner of Human Rights and Commissioner Mike Rothman, who heads Minnesota's Department of Commerce, to talk about these issues. Also on the program, Ron Elwood. Ron Elwood is the supervising attorney for the Legal Rights Center in Minnesota? Legal Services, Legal Services Center? C okay, thank you. Thank you. Well. <laughs> okay. Uh, Legal Services Advocacy Project. That's, uh, thank you for correcting me, that, correcting me with that. And uh, Scott Gray, President, CEO of the Minneapolis Urban League. Uh, Scott, thank you for hosting this program and thank you for being here as well. Uh, let me start with uh, uh, Commissioner Lindsay. Uh, set the stage about borrowing and uh, credit and the impact of credit practices on our community, on black people. Thank you, Al. Um, if I may, I think that there's two kind of aspects to that. Typically, people think of it as it relates to being a consumer. Most of us are consumers. At some point in time, we're either buying a car, buying a house, we're purchasing various goods. So it's important for us to be able to understand the choices that we make when we decide to purchase various items through credit and understanding sort of compounding interest uh, what it means to pay on time and to the extent what those potential consequences are if we do not pay on time or if we make the very minimum payment on our credit card. And that's critically important within our uh, economic system here in the United States. But I also would say that it's also important if you're an entrepreneur or if you're a business owner to be able to have financial literacy and understand the consequences of borrowing and being able to finance your respective business. So it's important as a consumer, and it's also potentially important as an entrepreneur or as a business owner. For the Department of Human Rights, there are three primary areas uh, where we do our work. The very first is investigating complaints of discrimination. So to the extent that you're a consumer and you feel that you're being taken advantage of unfairly on the basis of your race and you're being uh, unfairly targeted uh, with unfair credit or illegal credit, you have the ability to bring claims to the Department of Human Rights. There is an agency which is responsible for regulating um, those entities day in and day out, and that's the Department of Commerce. So I'm very happy to have uh, my fellow commissioner here on the stage so he can explain the role of the Department of Commerce and what they do day in and day out in those areas. The second area for the department, uh, I'm not going to talk too much today about, and that is to provide equal opportunity on state contracts. Um, the third area, though, for the department, I will spend some time today talking about that, and that's the education aspect. And that's trying to eliminate discrimination, also try to reduce disparate outcomes. And again, as consumers, as business owners, we need to become better educated so that we do not face disparate outcomes in the area of how we access credit and how we utilize credit. And so Mike Rothman, uh, Commissioner Rothman, what's the range of your responsibility in protecting uh, the consumer around credit and finance issues? Thank you, Alan, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today to talk about these important issues. Uh, the Department of Commerce's role is uh, as a regulator. Uh, we have enforcement staff, investigations uh, that we do 
as well as uh, the overriding scope of the department is to protect consumers. Uh, throughout uh, a lot of financial industries, we oversee uh, part of the banking sector, the state banks. We oversee uh, insurance in Minnesota. We oversee the real estate agents. There's 22,000 real estate agents we license, uh, and uh, sort of the mortgage industry at the state level, among a bunch of other financial services, uh, individuals, professionals, and entities. Uh, we also have, in their consumer protection uh, area, a strong outreach education uh, component. And as uh, Commissioner Lindsay just mentioned, uh, financial literacy is a very important component of all that. It's, I look at it as uh, not only just literacy, but capability uh, for us, for me, and part of my investigation and consumer protection role is to empower them with the knowledge to help detect scams and never be uh, a part of a fraud, uh, and then to help report it to us so we at the department can take action to help stop it. Is the public hearing and understanding that? I get releases from you all the time yeah. about uh, people being victimized or scammed, so these are great warnings, and we try to make sure that we pass that information on to our readers. Uh, I think it's a good service that you do. Is the public generally aware? Is it listening and hearing uh, the warnings that you're sending out? I think so, but I also think there could be more. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, uh, you know, for example, when we put out a, an alert, as you mentioned, it's to say we have stopped a scam in a particular person to, to invite others who have also been scammed by that person or similarly to know and contact us so we can stop people in the future. Um, today we put out a, uh, an investment alert on, you know, how people can best understand and work with brokers, financial planners. There's a lot of complexity, and uh, it's most important, I think, to have the knowledge and education so you can navigate those complexities. And then if you don't and you need help, call us at the Department of Commerce. We have staff on call. They answer the phones every day, uh, and um, we, we're here to help. I'd like to so Please, what Mike has said there, because I do think that it is important that we have more education in these respective areas. So first off, I'd like to commend him for really embracing financial literacy and bringing that to uh, the people within the state of Minnesota, and also to commend you, Al, for having this type of a conversation. Too often, from a cultural standpoint, that we don't, it's a taboo to talk about financial literacy and money. Uh, one of my favorite comedians has this joke about you could talk about uh, what's going on in your personal life as it relates to your significant other, and that's okay. You can talk in great detail about that. But once the topic turns to money, oh no, we can't talk about that at all. So I really appreciate you uh, having this kind of dialogue and also uh, Scott at the Urban League having this dialogue. It's really important that people know uh, what is going on in this area. Scott, let me ask you to step in here and talk about the community that we serve. I have to, in the spirit of disclosure, uh, indicate that I'm a board member uh, and serve uh, the board as the chairman, so I'm pleased to do that. Sure, well, uh, appreciate you doing <laughs> that as well. And, but this organization has been a stalwart uh, defender sure. of the people of our community and sure. of our values and of our sure. opportunity. What are the concerns sure. of uh, our community as you read it right now? Uh, we have this horrific experience with uh, the tornado two years ago, sure. and the community is reeling from that steel. Sure. What are our concerns from your well, point of view? Well, Al, where did you start? I mean, we have some of the widest disparities in this community um, in the state of Minnesota around education, around health, around uh, wealth and housing, uh, and around jobs. And so our focus at the Urban League is really to advocate in all those four areas, but really to create solutions uh, to some of those challenges that we see our, our, our fellow colleagues in our community facing. Um, we're particularly concerned about wealth. Um, um, you know, when you look at what the housing crisis has done to this community and other communities, um, you know, African Americans have lost uh, approximately half of their wealth. Um, and that's huge. Uh, that men means that uh, that we might send less kids to college because we might use the equity in our home to do that. We might create less businesses uh, because we don't have any equity to do that. And if there is a financial crisis like a tornado that, that rolls through here, um, we might not have the funds to 
uh, to cash in on equity to, to help uh, stabilize our family. And so there's a real concern around housing and wealth. And, um, you know, we, um, when you look at the housing statistics, home ownership after the crisis, I mean, I, and, and maybe uh, Commissioner Lindsay can correct me on this, I mean, we're almost 40 percentage points behind in home ownership, uh, white families uh, as compared to black families. So we're talking roughly about 66% home ownership for white families, and we're talking about 25% um, for uh, black families. And so when you look at a number like that, um, you become uh, very concerned uh, as an advocate for people in this community uh, that we have to ramp this up and we have to, to, to really get at this, this issue in real time um, because it's so much um, is integrated into um, what our community looks like. Uh, if we don't have a stable community, uh, the result of that is probably there is some uh, joblessness, uh, there is some homelessness, and there's foreclosure going on. Um, and at the end of the day, we don't have home ownership. Uh, we don't have ownership uh, as a community. Ron Elwood, uh, you represent uh, the interests of the poor statewide. Uh, you've been an advocate. And as you hear this discussion, Scott and I, as Northsiders talking about it, you sort of put this in the context of the, the problems people experience across our state. And how do you describe that? How does it look to you? Uh, how are the poor being regarded, uh, engaged, worked with, uh, supported in Minnesota, and what do we need to do better than we are right now? Well, thank you, Al, and, and again, I, I do thank you for inviting me to participate with this very distinguished panel. It's really an honor to be sitting here with uh, Mr. Gray and Commissioners Rothman and Lindsay, thank you, and you as well. <laughs> um, to answer your question, um, you know, I, I I think uh, Mr. Gray had it, had it uh, nailed in terms of uh, the disparity, because that is probably the single most, the wealth disparities. Um, it, it, is, it, is, it cuts across uh, uh, income strata and, of course, racial strata and ethnic strata. And, and you know, Minnesota is way behind the rest of the country, which is... Um, unfortunate and, and, and it's, it should be preventable uh, or at least addressed. Um, it has serious consequences for individuals, for families, and for our economy. And it's, uh, it's just wrong and we should be doing something about it. And, um, and that's why, you know, the, 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 but it's not just um, isolated to North Minneapolis or, or communities of color, um, rural Minnesotans, uh, uh, are facing some serious problems in terms of the income um, disparities between uh, the wealth disparities. And, um, you know, I think the key to this whole thing is, is the, the ability to uh, uh, build, acquire, and retain and grow assets. And, um, you know, the, the program is, is about predatory lending, and, and I think to circle it back, uh, you know, that is what uh, drains wealth and assets from communities, whether it's the north side here in Minneapolis or uh, out in, you know, Moorhead, Minnesota. It, and, and, it's, and it's something I think, uh, you know, we've been starting to focus on uh, what can we do to align, to create and then align state policies and local policies to foster the ability of folks to start building up those assets and and protect them against the predators because you know there's a there's a myth that there's uh, you know poor people don't have any money well there's a lot of wealth and money in the community mm -hmm. and uh, if there weren't you wouldn't see all these scams aimed directly right here in river city uh, so that's something that we really have to, I think, uh, be more cognizant of and, and focus our collective attention on. So, Kevin, let's start with uh, 101. Let's define predatory lending. What does it mean? Uh, predatory lending is probably better answered by Mike, but I'll, I'll give it a shot here. I'm happy to you, okay. Uh, what we're really talking about is taking advantage of individuals who are not sophisticated uh, as it relates to financial information that they have. 
and trying to extract from them um, in a way to take advantage of their lack of knowledge in that area. So to Ron's point, um, I was thinking of a, a recent directive which came out from Mike's office concerning individuals um, who were elderly, who receive uh, a call as it relates maybe to potentially doing a reverse mortgage to provide them with more uh, income of a stream directly and failing to appreciate the fact that by entering into a reverse, reverse mortgage that they have now put themselves potentially in a position where they may be foreclosed upon or evicted out of the home that they have worked very hard to save for and have paid off. They've now put it back at risk. So that to me would be an example of it. So, uh, so Commissioner? Let me, let me uh, just jump in and add too. Uh, Kevin's absolutely right. Predatory lending uh, is a broad category. It's not a specific legal violation, but it's a bunch. Uh, it's an unfair lending practice, uh, an abusive practice, uh, a deceptive practice, or one that is fraudulent, just basically completely fraudulent. And not only is reverse mortgage a good example, um, but we have uh, a lot of credit examples where <clears throat> the interest rate is way too high, whether that's in a mortgage or in consumer loans. You know, sometimes there's loans out there we, that are exorbitantly high in interest rates. And I know Ron's a, a strong uh, advocate on these issues. And um, and at the end of the day, uh, you're right, and it's it's when uh, either a community or a consumer group is targeted uh, by lenders to take advantage of either the high interest rate, the equity that people have, that wealth we're talking about, um, and it could be high fees, uh, it could be uh, just a deception, improper appraisals, there's a whole host of these things. Uh, balloons. Balloons, yeah. So what I've said and I, I believe is that um, you kind of know it when you see it. Um, if you believe you're a victim of a fraud, we should, you should report it. You need to be educated about it. Um, and my, my view at the Department of Commerce as the commissioner is I have zero tolerance for fraud and abuse like that. So we'll work together to try to stop it once we know about it and then to educate people on how to help themselves and we're here to help in any way, all of us. So who are the predators? Um, and when we talk about this, we rarely want to name uh, the big companies that are household words that we have mortgages with, et cetera. But we should not be afraid to discuss even our friend companies that fail sometimes to do the right thing. And so who, I mean, I'm raising the question because Mike uh, Rothman, you were part of uh, navigating some huge settlements uh, the uh, U.S. Department of Just Justice uh, settled with maybe 10 or 12 major banking institutions uh, a multi-billion dollar settlement for uh, various kinds of fraud against consumers. Talk about that, and you're responsible for, uh, I think that maybe the nine or 10 biggest banks in the country were involved in that. So even known quantities uh, are ones that have failed the public good. We all know that a large part of the economic uh, crisis we just went through was uh, the mortgage crisis uh, and meltdown. Um, that bubble was uh, burst, and once it was burst, it uh, showed a lot of practices that were unfair. Um, the one you're just referencing included the robo-signing uh, activities, uh, went into the foreclosures, um, then there were, um, at the national level, some investigations in terms of a lot of other practices that, um, that were out there. Um, the Department of Commerce regulates state banks, so we oversee those, uh, uh, but we also work with our federal regulators like the OCC, the federal uh, and other uh, uh, federal regulators. 
Um, and so when you're talking about that uh, settlement, what happened there was uh, we made sure that Minnesota's consumers were protected. Um, I also believe that was one that involved the Attorney General of Minnesota um, and a lot of Attorney Generals around the country uh, stepping up and helping protect consumers as well. So uh, it was a concerted effort. I do have to, to say, though, that um, uh, one aspect of this is that although we see some signs of improvement in our housing market, we're, we have a long way to go. Um, you know, just last year, the numbers show that there were still 17,000 foreclosures or more in Minnesota. While the rate has gone down, it's three times higher than it was before the financial crisis, and it's a rate and it's an impact on the individual homes, it's on the communities and all of us. So, so what makes a home loan predatory? Well, if the interest rate is too high, if uh, a good example, another good example, we all know the lingo, it's a subprime loan, which is uh, when it doesn't fit the, the consumer appropriately, meaning, um, you know, it's, it's too much of a loan, either in principle or in interest, for their ability to pay it back based on their income or on their own financial capability. Um, also, what it involves, um, you know, they were overappraised. So home values were high when they uh, shouldn't have been. Uh, people's um, incomes were inflated that weren't really there. There was fraud there, mm -hmm. real fraud, uh, by, the, uh, by lending institutions. And uh, a lot of that we went after and, and took after. There's a lot of other various examples, but that goes, those are a lot of good examples of those. What have you noticed on the impact of the foreclosure crisis? And, and Ron, is the foreclosure crisis over? By no means it is over. I think uh, Commissioner Rothman hit the nail on the head. You know, there's a lot of headlines every day. We see trends down. It's, you know, the percentages are lower. But I think that paints a very dangerous and inaccurate picture. I think Commissioner got it exactly right. Um, when, when you hear that foreclosures are three times what they ought to be, that is telling you something is still seriously wrong. Okay, so they're not... 3.5 times or four times, they're still three times higher. 18,000 people. I mean, that's a lot of people. And it's too much. It's, I mean, one is too many, but, you know, the, but so I think, I think the message that we're hearing in the media and all over the place is, is, is very inaccurate, dangerous, and misleading because it gives the impression that we don't have to, there's nothing, we shouldn't be doing anything more. Um, you know, but while, of course, we, we always focus on what's wrong, I, I do want to point out one thing that Minnesota did right. And several years ago, uh, the state legislature enacted the uh, anti-predatory lending mortgage uh, uh, law, anti-predatory mortgage lending law. And, and frankly, that became uh, the uh, basis in many ways of, of the Dodd-Frank bill uh, that's now federal, it's now national law across the country. And so all of those uh, abuses uh, are now illegal in Minnesota, and not only are they illegal, but if, if, if somebody does perpetrate that, the individual has the right to go and, and sue and, and get relief. So, I mean, that's something that's, that's a really important thing, and what we're focusing on now is the next wave of all this stuff is those loan mod scams. Um, so, you know, now you're in foreclosure, and of course people are, you know, you're, you're, you're in, a, in a terrible state, and it's uh, stressful, and it's... Uh, so you call them loan mod scams, but when the term loan mod first came out, it was the government's sending a helping hand That's right. to protect people that were abused by the, uh, the big scam, right? And so now you're saying there's a loan mod scam? People. You know, when, when there's an opportunity to make a buck, you know somebody's going to come up with it. I, I just always wonder, do they actually sit up all night long and think of this and then wake up in the morning and go, I got a new way to rip people off because I, I just it was amazing to me. So, so the deal is this, of course, now that you know, there is a free program in Minnesota. If you're in foreclosure, uh, the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency operates a free foreclosure prevention program. Anybody in the state of Minnesota, no matter who you are, if you're in foreclosure, you can get free help and try to negotiate with the bank to get a loan modification and save your home. Well, there are businesses that have cropped up, usually individuals actually, and they will come and offer to save your home, but not for free, for two, three thousand bucks. 
but really many of them have no intention of actually doing anything. So those are the latest things that, that have, I think, arrived on the scene and uh, a couple of, uh, there is a law that prevents folks from taking the money up front and if folks have been uh, victimized by that, um, they should be calling the Department of Commerce and the Attorney General's office or coming to legal aid. And uh, we've got a bill at the Capitol just uh, that the governor uh, uh, just signed a couple of weeks ago, actually, that uh, created that tamped down on a loophole that uh, that some folks were slipping through to evade the protections that are in, in law. So. Um, I think uh, it, it, to answer your question, though, it is not over, and I think we still need to be vigilant and, and continue to look at what's going on and address it. So Ron is right. If if somebody believes they're a victim of a modification scam, they should call the Department of Commerce. We have the authority to stop this, and we have. A good example of this is uh, we've, we've put cease and desist orders and put people out of business for doing this. Uh, there was an incident uh, where a company scammed 118 homeowners out of two to $3,000 each, promising they would help fix their mortgages. Well, they never did. They stole the money, and uh, the victims were twice victims. One of the foreclosure issue, and then second, the perp pe perpetrators of this. So we, we definitely have to stop them. And, and the other piece about this is I do think it's important uh, for views for all of us uh, to reference uh, the Minnesota Home uh, buyers Center, the homeowners, homeowner cent home ownership center, uh, and they have terrific programs to help educate uh, consumers, potential purchasers uh, on how to buy home, how to stay in home. The, the numbers are, are terrific. When you go through a program and you learn about that stuff, you're 30 percent more likely uh, to sustain a mortgage and do well and keep your wealth, as, as we're talking about here. So, Go ahead. Mm -hmm. A real red flag for everyone out there is when somebody says, I'll help you solve your credit card balances, or I'll help you loan modify your house. All I need, though, is your checking account number. <laughs> and let me bill you, you know, just a little taste, like 1000 or 1500 and then we'll start working on that. If you hear that, call Mike's office, yeah. <laughs> okay? And so that's the same question here. What uh, factors should consumers be wary of when they're trying to uh, um, purchase or refinance their home? So you've named some, but what else should they be watching out for? Well, the, the make sure, number one, that you're dealing with uh, uh, credible folks. Uh, you've looked into it, done your research in terms of, of you know, the type of loan. Uh, that you've talked to if you need somebody with a financial si assistance. We talked about the Home Ownership Center who for free can help you understand that. Um, if the interest rates are too high, uh, if something doesn't seem right and... What's high these days? Well, you know, <laughs> they're low these days. Mm -hmm. So if it's so high, seven, eight, ten percent, okay. anything That's like high, that, yeah, yeah. you know. Uh, the standard right now is, is probably in the low fours. Uh, uh, 3.9. 3.9, yeah. Mm -hmm. So make sure you check what they are. Anything above that, uh, you know, be a smart shopper is what it comes down to. If, you, if it sounds too good to be true, stop. I like to tell this to everybody that, um, you know, my family, even my grandmother, if it sounds too good to be true, it is. Stop, hang up the phone stop the conversation, and then if you need help, call us at the Department of Commerce, call the Home Ownership Center, call Legal Aid, anything, that we're, we're here to help. Lead. Call Urban Lead, call us, and we're here to help. Mm -hmm. yep. Don't ever give any credit card information or checking account or any personal financial information over the phone to anybody. We had um, uh, the story about subprime lending. What's, what is subprime lending, and has the crisis and the awareness that's come from it eliminated subprime lending? Well, I think we could all talk about that. Let me just uh, tee it up. Subprime lending, uh, there is a, the prime market where standard loans are made. Um, for, for those people in the industries that have a higher risk level, uh, there are lenders who will, will lend, but at a higher interest rate. And this, so, so that's called subprime lending. And, um, and we learned that that whole marketplace can be very abusive. Um, 
At the same time, there are instances when uh, if you are, it, it may be for just some people, the only means to a, a loan. And my, my advice is to be extra cautious, to, to know what you're getting into, understand what it is. Um, and then again, if there's any mis, uh, you know, if there's uh, discrepancies, issues, fraud you suspect, just stay away from it. So when you're talking really that, that prime loan? So if you don't have any issues in your background, what would you expect to pay for like a car loan? Sure. And then you start talking about the subprime. I might have stumbled financially in the past. I'm going to get to a different market. I'm going to pay a little bit more. But the question is how much more? And unfortunately, this is kind of this, this dynamic of education and conversation. We don't really want to talk about sort of those situations and what that market is. So I really appreciate Scott providing sort of an environment for that conversation to be had, Al, for you doing that as well, because that's really where we're getting at, where people feel that because they've made one mistake in the past, that they have to pay this exorbitant fee going forward, and that's where they get taken advantage of. And one thing that we, we need to, uh, I mean, there's arguments out there, both sides, you know, arguments that, uh, you know, this is all a complete fraud. On the other side, people will say, uh, you know, access to credit at some level is important for some folks. The problem is, is that some of the credit people get themselves involved in is bad and it's, it can create a cycle uh, that they can't get out of mm -hmm. and it can lead to more trouble. And, uh, and so, for example, if they should never have been involved in that in the first place, it can be real trouble. So, so what, is, what is race a question? How do you know if your race, uh, uh, Commissioner Lindsay, is something that's blocking you from getting credit or the right kind of credit? Uh, I remember the uh, Eddie Murphy skit on um, Saturday Night Live, my favorite one, where uh, he went into a bank looking for a loan for his business, and uh, white banker, black Eddie Murphy, uh, no, 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 and uh, all kinds of reasons it didn't make sense. Eddie walks out and leaves. White guy comes in and wants to borrow the same money, presumably the same characteristics, and the uh, banker just gets up and starts shoving money at him. Th that's racial discrimination, I think. And I think that's what a lot of black businesses say they experience, and I think black consumers say they experience the same thing, where for whatever reason, well, no, because they are black, that's the reason they get treated differently. How do we report that and fight it if we feel it uh, to your agency? Well, first off, if anyone feels that they've been discriminated, they can call our respective agency. And uh, the general number to my assistant uh, so we can get it properly filed is 651-539-1121. Um, there is a recent study uh, that was commissioned with the Urban League and the University of Minnesota talking about individuals seeking to get a loan. And what we found within that respective study is that households which were comprised of African Americans which had an a, a equity of more than $150,000 were being denied at twice the rate of a household which was led by individuals who were white, not of Hispanic origin, which only had a third of the equity or income that that couple had. So discrimination does happen in the state of Minnesota. Um, it doesn't explain all of it, um, but it is part of the problem, and we have to take that on and face it and deal with it. So um, part of it's education. So if I feel as uh, someone who comparably makes the same money as my friend, am I willing to have that conversation and say that I went to bank X, Y, and Z? Mike, I, I, is that the rate that you, would, you got quoted? You know, and get that type of information and then feel willing to come forward. And that's difficult because from a cultural standpoint, no one wants to feel like they were taken advantage of. But to you, how you started this, right? Mm -hmm. You can't grow assets, you can't grow wealth, though, unless you have that information. I mean, if we're operating a business, shame on me once, but <laughs> it's my fault the second time. So in this sense, we have to be willing to step forward and have that real conversation. So that's the, I, I think Commissioner hit it on the head, but I would also add that it's a relationship um, gap in this town as well, in this community. 
And, uh, you know, far too often that same study that the, the University of Minnesota uh, did with the Urban League showed that um, African Americans were six times more likely to be denied for loans. And, you know, I know they can plug our numbers in a computer. Uh, you know, we could take race off the application. Um, but at the end of the day, when, a, when you're sitting down with a broker or you're sitting down uh, with a bank, um, you know, a lot of it is a relationship. And we, we have to come to the realization that, um, uh, that in some respects, um, others have been able to uh, connect and make opportunity and build wealth, um, and they just haven't been measured by the same standards. And although I like Eddie Murphy as a comedian, um, this, this is real out here. People are seeing it. I mean, we hear so many folks. We hear, we're bringing a, a, a keynote for our, um, our gala, um, Damon John, who, who is um, very wealthy at this point. But when he started his business, um, he was denied 10 times by 10 different banks. Uh, his net worth today is about $200 million. Uh, he had to take the equity out of his mom's home. Uh, to basically get his business off the ground. And so there are so many people out there that could tell that same type of story. And where will we be uh, if someone, if more folks like Damon John um, were able to create these large enterprises and, and other folks were to, to be able to look at them and say, hey, I could do this too. But it, you know, when you go into a bank and you're denied, um, bank after bank, you know, you start to lose your confidence a bit in what you can do. And not that I'm saying that we should throw out credit score because those things are important, but we, we need to really look at alternative models to, to making sure that a community that is so depressed at this point has an opportunity to catch up. What I'm seeing right now is that home ownership seems to, you know, we're starting to hear flashes that that, that it is getting better, that banks are loosening up their lending. Um, but we're so far behind to be 40 points behind, you know, you have to have almost a Superman effort to catch up. And I would ask our governor, our commissioners, our community, our banks to really talk about how can we go from being the largest, having the largest disparity gap um, in housing um, that leads to some equity issues, to how can we turn this around and be number one in the country? Because we're so, you know, you look at the paper, we're number one at a lot of things. Um, and last time I checked, this is a very safe community, great place to live, great park system, but for some reason there is a block when it comes to parity in this community. And we, uh, you know, it has to become our business to figure out how to do better. Americans, Scott and I do, and we see these as questions of poverty or wealth and the poverty wealth gap, but we also see that in the context of our culture, of our ethnicity, of, of race. And uh, I'm speaking for us, I think, that we see this as structural barrier to opportunity and engagement to uh, development for black people by uh, a white supremacy system. That's how I see it. Now, maybe you don't see it that way, Scott, but that's Al McFarland. So how do, but this is really bigger than just black. And the same problems whites in rural Minnesota face and feel the same way. So how do we get coalitions or ideas that link uh, this pattern in a way that we can identify it, name it, and address it, dismantle it? $64 million question. I mean, if I had the answer, I would, uh, 
would, that, that, that would, would, that, that would. Which, which would, would yeah, which would, yeah, I'm sure you would be welcome that, actually. You'd, you'd go find another job then. Um, but, you know, I, I also uh, want to point out, it's, it's also, um, you know, uh, uh, white Minnesotans right here in the Twin Cities that are that are also experiencing the same thing. But the bottom line is, though, I mean, I think, you know, you've, you've, you've again, put your finger on, you know, the, the institutional racism is, you know, it's it's still with us. And, and that, you know, the, there is no magic bullet, obviously. I mean, but I, I can tell you one thing that, that uh, legal aid has, um, is, has catalyzed or is, is catalyzing. And whether or not this is the silver bullet, I have no idea. But, um, you know, uh, I talked about this whole idea of asset development. And I really have come to believe that that is the holy grail. Whether, you know, cutting across all, whether it's racial, ethnic, and income. It, you know, it, it's, the, it's, the, it's the one thing that I think, um, you know, anybody who's poor and struggling, um, if if we could if we could create a system where uh, we all have the ability to do that, and so so legal aid has has the uh, uh, good fortune um, and and very very grateful to the Northwest Area Foundation, and and they have uh, given us a, a small sum of money, and we have brought on uh, a, a, a person to create something that we're calling the Minnesota Asset Building Coalition. And you know, as an advocate at the Capitol and in this in these realms, and and working with you all and everybody else for for 15 years here, the thing that has frustrated me the most is our worst enemies are ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because you know, I've been dealing with uh, these these scams, you know, debt settlement, loan mod, you know, payday lending, whatever it is, you know, one after the other. And then I go and ask my friends in this community, would you sign on my bill? And then I go ask my friends in the Latino community, can you know, sign on my bill and this and that. But the reality is, I'm just asking them to support what I think is important. And what we don't do very well is really talk to each other. And this idea of this coalition is to bring together organizations that are involved in some way in building assets, whether it's providing health care, child care, you know, anti-predatory lending protection, consumer protection, um, or, or, you know, uh, safety net uh, programs, job creation, it doesn't matter, because what all housing, affordable housing, all of those are assets that people need to be stable, to earn money, to get ahead, to build wealth. And what we're trying to do is go across the state and talk to the tribes and every, all, every ethnic community, every racial community, every uh, low-income community, and every, all the nonprofits out there who are working on this stuff. And instead of asking them to come on to our agenda, what we're suggesting here is, can we figure out together what is the agenda that everybody can support and feel ownership of. And frankly, I think that's the only way we're gonna succeed. I know that sounds pie in the sky. I know that sounds like Don Quixote, you know, or Sancho Panza tilting at windmills, and I will be the first to admit that. But um, what, what Northwest Area was so kind to do, uh, they asked us, well, what, 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 you think it can succeed? And I told them, well, I can tell you this. Um, you know, if we don't get somebody to try to coordinate this, I can guarantee you we'll fail. I can't guarantee you we'll succeed, but if we don't try, I can guarantee you we'll, we'll, we will fail. It's just about equity. Wealth is about equity. It's what Creating it's about. And equity, yep. not only financial equity, but emotional and political uh, and mental, uh, spiritual equity, so that you have a sense of complete ownership, uh, a sense of uh, being uh, connected to the sovereign nature of our nation, of our country, right, of our communities. And so that's, I think, in part, what is lacking is a system that supports, encourages, identifies this feeling and the reality of being part of the sovereign, of owning that, and therefore being a director of community of society and of the governance and of the resources of government so that you can share and also you help build by your participation. Scott, what do you think? Well, 
I think you hit it right on the head. We, we have to believe in America that our most struggling family, if we can figure out a way to solve their issue, that we become one America, a real one America. Can I, can I just add just one point here? One of the things I think has been overlooked a little bit, Al, is I think our Attorney General and others have done some great work in this area on foreclosure. But I just pulled up an article that just, you know, begs the question, and to Ron's point, this whole thing about coalitions, I would just add a caveat that we need to have intentional coalitions, that we need to be directed at things to say that enough is enough. Because when I'm looking at this, I see that, you know, the, the 10 banks that, or 11 banks or whatever it is that we settle with, homeowners are now getting $300 um, you know, payment for the suffering and pain uh, that they had to go through, the two years of misinformation and all that kind of stuff that some of our families were in this whole foreclosure fight, and they're getting a $300 um, payment to say, you know, we recognize your pain, and this is what you're going to get paid for. And to me, there's still some injustice in that, that, you know, someone that could be sitting up at one of our uh, big multinational banks here um, or across this country could be happy with that is, uh, you know, is just beyond me, beyond my thinking. And we will not become one America if we continue to think like this. Well, we settled and this was the amount. And how can a family bounce back off of three to five hundred dollars after they may have lost their home or they they you know went through a loan modification, you know contracted attorney or whatever? I mean, a lot of these families are in more debt than what they started, uh, and they weren't really the cause of this foreclosure crisis. So I, I don't want to harp back on that point, but it just seems to me the end result. <laughs> is not an end result for some of these families getting three to five hundred dollars. And see, all of these, these issues are interrelated, interconnected, and we're not talking about silos. It's not just predatory lending, not just credit issues, not just uh, banking practices, but there's also the question, bigger question of equity and wealth creation. Kevin Lindsay, I heard you on a great interview this past Saturday on uh, KMLJ with uh, the senior program with our friend uh, Milford, Brother Milford. And the one thing that struck my attention was your description of the lay of the land in terms of the population demographics that uh, in Minnesota and in the country, thousands of people, I think you said 10,000 per day or per week, are leaving the workforce because of retirement, reaching the age of 65, that's what you said. Mm -hmm. And so that means those thousands of work opportunities may be coming available. And the question you raised is how do we get our people organized so that we get the jobs, that fill the jobs that are needed to run our country, our community, uh, our, our state, and how do we start with the jobs that we have theoretical control over, the state government, you said Minnesota uh, hires about 3,000 people a year. Is that the number that you said? 2,700, I think you said. Well, yeah. The, what I was talking about was the changing demographics within the United States. So every day in the United States, 10,000 people will retire. Today, tomorrow, the rest of this week, this month, the year, and then the balance of the decade, and then well into the next decade. And the vast majority of those individuals will be white, not of Hispanic origin. And for people of color in this country, this presents an opportunity for gainful employment as individuals retire out of the workforce. And this is something which is going on in the state of Minnesota. So when we take a look at all the individuals who are over the age of 55, if I was able to get them all in the studio, 10 out of 11 of those individuals would be white, not of Hispanic origin. So um, individuals who are in high school now and they're looking out and saying things are, are bleak, you know, it's not really bleak long term. You have to look at it as a citizen of one of the richest countries in the entire world with a gross domestic product of 15 trillion. And a lot of people say that China is catching up to us. Well, China's gross domestic product is six billion. It's large, six but, or six trillion, but it's only, it's less than half of what ours is. So what does that mean going forward? You have a tremendous opportunity 
to shape your country's direction going forward. And, and so this gets to this challenge as it relates to it. And so put that in the context of the question of how then we develop equity, we develop wealth, because it seems to be the first thing is a job. Second thing is property that appreciates over time. And then the third thing is the ability to leverage both of those plus ingenuity and will to create businesses, right? To serve our populations, which is what the Urban League is trying to do. So how do we be mindful and aggressive in pursuing uh, and engaging the changing dynamics to the advantage of our people? Sure. One of the things which I mentioned on our radio program was what was going on at the state. So at the state, last year we had more individuals retire from state employment than at any other point in time, except for the preceding year. <laughs> so what is happening now is that baby boomer effect is that we're going to have 3,000 people leave state employment for every year going forward for quite some period of time. What that then means is that there's going to be opportunities in a wide variety of positions within the state. We may not necessarily replace one for one with those respective jobs, but there will be significant opportunities there. And there will also be at the city of Minneapolis, the city of St. Paul, Ramsey County, and Hennepin County. Big employers. And all of those, in those positions will have an impact on the ability on which policy making decisions are also going forward. I really applaud the governor for providing opportunities to try and diversify senior leadership within the cabinet level agencies. When I was in college, I read this book called The Power Broker, and it's about a guy named Bob Moses in the city of New York. And Moses, the, the little quick vignette, is that at that point in time, not everyone had cars. Most people got around with double-decker buses. And he didn't like necessarily people of different ethnicities mixing. So what he did is, as an administrative official, is that he built bridges at such a level that certain double-decker buses couldn't get into certain boroughs. So that's a bad use <laughs> of public policy. But what would happen if we had more people who saw a more unified country, a more unified world, if they were in those positions, what good they could do? And I think that that's something, a message that we should be getting out to all people Absolutely. and try to uh, encourage people to see these as careers. And I, I, I just want to commend Commissioner Lindsay as well, and, and, and we haven't tooted his horn enough and the governor's horn about really um, raising the bar. Um, you know, to move the goal up to 32 percent, that is what I'm talking about, being, being intentional. Well, there's a 32 percent workforce participation goal for all state-funded projects. And so I, I would say that... And it used to be 11 percent. Right. Mm -hmm. Somewhere way below that. <laughs> and so I would say that that is an intentional strategy, that if we know that the goal is 32 percent, we can start galvanizing our workforces and figuring out a way to create an opportunity to get them to that point. If the goal was less than that, then you know, you know, it, it, it would not ramp up. And when I'm talking about ramping up, 32% goal means you have to ramp up. It is double what it was before. And so if we can continue to focus like that, if the state can lead the way and our corporate community can start to fall in behind that, as as Kevin talked about this 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 demographic shift in our community, hello, there would be jobs waiting. And if people know that jobs are waiting, they'll get the kind of educational resources that they need to build the equity so that they can move to those jobs. And you know, at the same time, we're hoping that they're being you know innovative as well to think about creating business opportunities because that goal, is going, is, you know, is going up as well. And we think that if we create more business opportunities, you know, people of color tend to hire other people of color or people that look like them. And so to me, the 32% goal is a real intentional strategy. And if others can fall behind and lead the way, um, as the state is leading the way, we could have some real change in this community. Gentlemen, I want to thank you all for being here. Final word, uh, Commissioner Rothman. Uh, let me uh, go back to this. This is April. April 1st was uh, proclaimed by Governor Dayton to be Financial Literacy Month and capability is a big uh, component of all that. Uh, at the state level, Commissioner Lindsay and I and 10 other or 10 total state agencies have thought outside the box. How can we uh, build financial 
education, capability, literacy for Minnesotans and the, uh, some of the uh, nonprofits that are out there. We've been recognized um, by the President's Council on Financial Capability, shown a, a light on Minnesota. I think it comes back to education. Um, at the Department of Commerce, we've tried to pull together not only state agencies, but folks like Ron and a lot of other nonprofits to focus on uh, how people can be educated and all of their financial issues. Um, that will help them, uh, help them in their lives individually as they succeed, and then help us, uh, I think all of us as a community, grow. So really, thank you for having us here today. Well, thank you all for being here. Ron, Ron Hillwood, thank you for being here. Uh, Commissioner Mark Rothman and Commissioner Kevin Lindsay, uh, Scott, Scott uh, Gray, President of the Minneapolis Urban League, thank you all for being here and for hosting this program. Thank you for watching. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. Good night. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We gotta say good night. We wanna thank Al McFarland for bringing us all those great words and all our lovely guests, all the guests in the house. Everything's good, you know. So I want y'all to tune in every Tuesday morning, right around 9 o'clock. Because we're going to play a song. All the guests will be home. We'll be feeling like talking. Have a robust conversation. Because this thing is safe. The message is clear. Everybody knows we got to give it life.